Stanford University. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. This is indeed a select group of experts, and it's always a pleasure, you know, to see the you know the true authorities in the class present and attending uh, on this day of days. So since uh, you know we spent a lot of time in section yesterday, and I attended the the afternoon section, <coughs> the you know the stalwarts at uh, five fifteen, going over Clarman's argument, uh, which I think you know for my money is probably the definitive treatment of uh, Brown v. Board. Um, you know, it's, you know, as you know, as actually you can tell from the bibliography for the paper assignments, uh, the literature on Brown is vast. There's the enormous book by David Garrow, uh, who writes kind of, you know, seven to eight hundred page books. There's uh, Taylor Branch's work on the civil rights movement, you know, also leading to Brown and so on. Um, so I, I assume we have sufficient material out there to, to think about, you know, the merits of the decision. You know, the one point I want to stress, which I think, uh, you know, is always worth repeating, is, you know, to see it, Essentially, as, as much as a political decision as a legal decision, and that was that was Justice uh, Chief Justice Warren's conscious choice. And the admirable thing about the decision was he was able to rally the court to it, to make the decision unanimous. Uh, you know, without I think I believe without any concurring opinions, you know, much less dissents, uh, and to bring aboard and you know into one united team, uh, nine justices, uh, in pursuit of a cause that you know every orthodox American constitutional. Uh, scholar and authority would say is you know probably the single most important issue uh, in, in in American constitutional history. A uh, little record of this, I think, is actually a note from Frankfurter <coughs> to uh, to um, uh, to the chief. Ah, here's the link. Good. Uh, written on. I'm not sure about the, the deal with the date here. Uh, looks like May 20th is scratched out. May 17th inserted. I I don't know about that. It says you know, dear chief. Um, this is a day that will live in glory. I mean, it's a small piece of paper. You could have easily used it in other ones. So, uh, this is a day uh, that will live in glory. Uh, it, it is also a great day in the history of the court. Uh, and okay, what's the, we one one in wait? What does it say? One in the in the least uh, for the course of deliberation, which brought about the result. I congratulate you very sincerely. Felix Frankfurter, of course, you know, Frankfurter was, in some ways, though, a New Deal liberal, was one of the most conservative voices uh, on the court, uh, someone who wanted to be deeply deferential to legislative authority, who, in a sense, kind of embodies the reaction against the excesses of jurisprudence pre-1937. Uh, in a sense, you know, kind of saw that with the flag salute cases, you know, back in, you know, back in 1940, 1943. Okay, so enough about Brown. Uh, what I want to you know, uh, devote today's uh, lecture discussing uh, in this course is Rosa Parks uh, being fingerprinted uh, in Montgomery uh, you know, for the, uh, over, over the bus issue. By the way, if you want to see the bus, uh, you have to go to Detroit. Detroit, or in the Army, we call it Detroit, uh, and go out to the Henry Ford Museum, which is actually a great place to see American motor vehicles. A good friend of ours was like the vice president or executive director there, recently retired. But they, you know, they have the bus. They have the limo from Kennedy's assassination. There's, you know, it's, it, is, it is a great tribute to American automotive history. You know, <laughs> you know well, well worth the visit if you ever want to go to Detroit. That raises some other questions of its own. Um, anyhow, so the great challenge post-Brown is really where I want to pick up with uh, this morning. Um, you know, we might say if, if we, as, actually, as, we said, as I said a little bit about yesterday in, in Lily's second section, if you, if you think like a historian, um, the great challenge, or you know, one primary challenge when you define a problem is always to periodize it, to try to get some sense of what are the chronological boundaries within which you want to work uh, in order to you know, think uh, uh, analytically uh, and interpretively about a subject. So I think there are you know, two big sets of boundaries uh, to think about uh, in the history of Brown. One is the one we've you know, discussed already. How do you get there? Uh, I, I still like the concept of legal strategy. Clarman's very good. Uh, on you know, explaining how that strategy and the course position relates to you know, shifting currents in American public opinion, uh, both the long view and then I think, I think many people still say the legacy of World War II uh, on you know, deep understandings of the you know, essential nature, fundamental nature of human rights would also be a big part of it. But I think the better part of the story, the more intriguing part of the story is, you know, is not the prequel but the sequel. 
Uh, it's not how do you get uh, to 1954, 1955, to Brown 1 and 2. Uh, how did you get from Brown uh, to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965? And particularly, if you want to approach the history of the Constitution the way that I hope, but it, but hope I'm succeeding in doing uh, this quarter as a story not of constitutional law, but of history more broadly defined, the critical thing about getting to the mid-1960s is to have a story which involves, A, all three branches of the national government. How is it that you form uh, you know, a kind of cohesive uh, commitment uh, within the national government uh, to uh, policy. And of course, this also has major implications for how we think about the structure of American federalism. Because in the aftermath of Brown, and I should say actually in the aftermath of the Southern response to Brown, and this of course is where Mike Farman's notion of the backlash thesis uh, will, you know, will, will, will start to come, in, come into play, the revival or the persistence of those kinds of state sovereignty arguments that in some ways we can run all the way back to 1798 or we can run it back to the 1820s and you know, John C. Calhoun and uh, the rise of you know, the nullification doctrine and so on and so on. Uh, it's not trivial. It's an interesting matter that Mississippi established a state sovereignty commission uh, in, you know, in the aftermath of Brown in order to vindicate its, its, its historic rights. It's actually been studied well by uh, actually one of, the, you know, one of the former TAs in this class, a guy named Joseph, Joe Crispino, uh, who now teaches at Emory, uh, if, you're really, if you're really interested in that subject. So the revival of states' race arguments and the full mobilization of the national government uh, behind the post-Brown program of desegregation seems to me these are really massive developments in American constitutionalism more broadly defined. In other words, it's not just a story about constitutional law and the elaboration of judicial doctrine. Uh, it's essentially a story uh, in which you know, we really need a comprehensive account of how the whole government gets involved. Okay? So the way to think about this, and I think I've anticipated some of these points already, uh, first is, you know, in, 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 in Brown 2, uh, the court, uh, you know, commits the federal judiciary uh, to pursuing uh, the project of school desegregation with all deliberate speed, but what is it that goes into deliberate? You know, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you measure it? Uh, what kind of rubric or matrix or whatever do you set up to say, you know, is, de is deliberate fast or slow? So I think I mentioned the other day. So, you know, I mean, perfectly plausible to say, well, de minimis, uh, maybe all deliberate speed would be a 12-year program or 13-year program. Start with K and go to 12, you know, year by year. Uh, you can't, don't do a whole school system in once. You know, have kind of focused attention on one grade after, you know, after another. Don't, don't try working with teenagers who are already, you know, uh, defiant and, you know, are likely to, uh, you, know, to uh, you know, to oppose you. Or it might be that, you know, fears about, you know, and this is a major motif here, fears about the sexual consequences, relations between the races. Uh, if you desegregate high school, maybe that's something you want to put off confronting for a few years and so on. And secondly, independent of that kind of strategic consideration, uh, this is a strategy of litigation. I mean, you still have to go out and, uh, you know, in fact, you know, try these cases out on a kind of case-by-case -case basis. I mean, it would be nice uh, if, in fact, you had this kind of great aperçu uh, you know, this kind of great, you know, sudden realization that this whole system of racial subordination is wrong and we should all fall in with what the Supreme Court did. That's, you know, in a sense, that's, that's an argument that actually was made by uh, my friend and colleague Bill Nelson in his book about the 14th Amendment. That one way to explain why the 14th Amendment, um, you know, why its, its meaning, its complications would not have been thoroughly resolved uh, by, uh, you know, the 39th Congress was that in a kind of fundamentally Protestant universe, the idea, you know, which 19th century America was, the idea of, you know, uh, accepting and internalizing moral judgment might by itself be, if not sufficient, might itself mark a powerful step forward. Now, it wasn't the, you know, it wasn't the situation that confronted, uh, you know, the American people after 1954 and 1955. Uh, all deliberate speed still meant you needed some strategy of litigation. It meant you needed the Justice Department or the NAACP, uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, would need to commit, you know, X amount of resources, and you'd still need to identify plaintiffs and, you know, get them to stick with the case and work out solutions at the local basis and, what, what, you know, and rely upon district court judges. Uh, to figure out what equitable remedies were and were not, you know, how, you know, how, how quickly would you want to go, and so. But it's an interesting uh, reflection. This there's a, you know, not, I'm not big enough expert in the subject to speak authoritatively, but if you look at the, uh, the recent ruling, you know, suspending uh, Obama's immigration policy that came out of Brownsville, Texas. You know, Brownsville is I've, I've been there. It's the southernmost point in the continental, you know, United States. Um, it's you know, people used to go across the border. 
to, uh, what is it, Matamaros, I think is the city across the border, but now it's so dangerous there that uh, there's, nor there's northern traffic but no southern traffic. In any case, there's an interesting debate. Uh, you know, the, the judge ruled in a case to which I think something like 11 states are parties, but uh, technically, I think, I think the issue, as I understand it, is whether the remedy he's proposing applies only to that district. You know, what's the scope of his jurisdiction? If our lawyer, I could answer this better. I'm not. Um, but I think that's an issue that comes out of this. Anyhow, the key thing to realize is a commitment to deliberate speed still involves a strategy of litigation, which is going to be subject to all kinds of issues of timing and efficacy uh, and so on. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two, um, massive resistance and, uh, and, and, and the backlash thesis. Um, let's see, let's, let's uh, step forward here. So we, here we are in 1954. Well, actually, uh, let me interject this point. So the other th way to think about this, and certainly fits in with Clarvin's argument, the larger story I want to tell today, is that there's a litigation story, and then there's going to be a political story, but there is also a social movement story. Uh, there is that, you know, again, again, this is part of the strategy of litigation, so that, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott, which Rosa Parks initiates, she didn't do it because she was an angry woman on a given day who said, you know, well, I was going to say Gnug is Gnug, but you know, that's Yiddish. You know, enough is enough. You know, she didn't say enough is enough. I'm not going to go sit in the back of the bus. This was also a strategic act as part of a campaign. But she's arrested. That leads to the Montgomery bus boycott. That pr puts a lot of pressure, for one thing, on the Montgomery bus company to stay solvent uh, and leaves open you know, the opportunity. And of course, it's joined famously uh, by Martin Luther King, you know, a very young minister uh, at this point. Uh, you know, here he is you know, under arrest, prisoner 7089. Uh, and uh, well, actually, this is not Montgomery. This is the. Uh, is, uh, I take that back. This is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is Birmingham. Um, and so, something I didn't check. But you know, King. You know, who's just you know one of many ministers uh, attached you know to, to this cause. But King starts to emerge, you know, from this process as a potentially leading figure. Uh, so it's important to note that in a sense, what you're dealing with here um, is a you know is in part uh, you know is in part a social movement. You know that you know that's you know, that in fact this is what we would now call perhaps a form of popular constitutionalism in the sense that ordinary, I mean, it's a, it's a term we associate actually with Larry Kramer, who gave it a specific meaning for political controversies in the 19th century where the parties would actively commit to favor one position or other, and the electorate kind of argues it out. But now the term, it happens with a lot of terms, the term has become more expansive. It happens with a lot of terms introduced for a specific purpose, and people borrow them and kind of sense rip them off or appropriate them for their own purposes. So, popular constitutionalism now mean, you know, can also mean uh, which constitutional attitudes and values seep into the, you know, seep into the people in general, provide a basis for them to act uh, in pursuit of their political and their constitutional commitments. So, in a sense, that's also what's going on, you know, in you know in Montgomery and Birmingham and every place else that protests, you know, be, be, begin to emanate. The African Americans, I think it's actually one of the most remarkable facts in, in their histories of people, retain a deep attachment to the American Constitution. Might well say they should have reached the opposite conclusion. But going back actually to Frederick Douglass, as kind of the, you know, early progenitor of this, uh, the African American commitment to pursuing constitutional values rather than repudiating the seem seems to me a kind of remarkable feature. Uh, in this whole story. So part of the story is, you know, that in addition to the litigation, there is a kind of, um, uh, you know, there is a kind of a social movement. And again, Clarman talks about this, so, you know, I don't want to repeat it too much. Uh, this also developing. Um, but in the constitutional story, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the main thing that happens is to, you know, first thing to do is actually, in a sense, to get from 1954, 55 uh, to 1958. So this is, uh, you know, actually, a pretty famous photograph from. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is from Little Rock. I think that's authoring Lucy, if I remember correctly, but I may I may be wrong on this. Um, but you know, this is kind of a pretty typical scene where you know, uh, you know, some group of young African Americans, you know, in a sense, volunteer, become willing advocates of the cause of segregation. She is dressed up in her very best clothing. Of course, people dress differently in the 50s, and particularly in the South. Uh, than you know, than they might do in our day, but you know, she's got really a kind of portrait of, you know, since middle class, you know, perhaps also religious dignity, you know, surrounded by kind of a heckling, southern crowd, and you know, you can only imagine the kind of racist, tripe or whatever that's you know that's that's you know, the surrounding her as she walks to school. So this is a scene that's repeated in a lot of places, but you know, the, the most famous example uh, is uh, in Little Rock. Arkansas, which I, you know, again, I remember as a boy, I mean, I was 11, and, you know, reading, reading the Chicago Sun-Times, which then was a respectable paper, uh, no longer. In Chicago, you have to read the Tribune, which is amazing. Um, so in Arkansas, um, you know, the course of school integration was vigorously opposed 
uh, by a number of figures, led by Governor Orville Faubus, F-A-U-B-U-S. Uh, and at least the kind of famous case of Cooper versus Aaron, uh, in which um, you know, the court reaffirms in very robust language its uh, commitment to the decision laid down only three years earlier. Uh, the court says we are the, you know, we, in effect, I'm you know, uh, paraphrasing in a very simple way here, but we, are, we have the legitimate authority to reach this decision, or quoting John Marshall, it is emphatically the province of the, of the court to declare what the law is. Uh, and this is actually, this is the case which, uh, I mentioned this much earlier in the class, this is a case which actually gives a lot of prominence or gives rhetorical prominence to Marbury versus Madison, you know, the famous 1803 case where Marshall, uh, in effect, re repeats a, a doctrine I think was already laid down, but, you know, gives it, you know, additional prominence. So why is the court repeating that doctrine? Well, you know, it could be because it's so difficult for it to implement its authority. Uh, by itself, you know, I mean, this is, and this, you know, kind of, kind of go back to what's actually all, almost a Madisonian critique of the limits of judicial authority. Uh, I think, yeah, actually, I think our understanding of judicial authority has probably shifted a lot over the last 50-some years. Uh, you know, if you remember, you know, early in the course where I talked about the difference between judicial review and judicial supremacy. So it's one thing to say courts have the authority to review acts of government to determine whether or not they're, you know, proper, but uh, to assert supremacy. And to be able to enforce it takes, you know, it takes a much bigger commitment. So this was, you know, again, this is the kind of thing, you know, as I say, I remember as a boy. Um, and, you know, people, you know, I think most people my age would. Um, it's, you know, it's, it was kind of a famous episode, and I always forget which division it was, but Eisenhower, who was not a great fan of desegregation, and was not a great admirer uh, of uh, Earl Warren, uh, even though he'd appointed him uh, to the court, uh, and, uh, you know, there's some Republican politics were, were involved there. And Eisenhower, of course, had you know, grown up, I think actually in the Seventh, I remember in the seventh Day Adventist household, I think, in what, Abilene, Texas, Kansas. you know. No, I think it's Kansas. It's, it's one of the Abilenes. It's a, he's it's from a, Texas, though, that's the thing. Yeah, but in any case, you know, his, you know, his attitudes you know, may not have been the most enlightened. But on the other hand, he had been a commanding general, and he was president of the United States. Uh, and, you know, he was no dummy, though. You know, his, his press conferences were famous because, you know, the, his sentences and paragraphs were endless. It was kind of hard to follow the, his rhetoric. But a lot of people felt that was actually the best. That's how, I, that's how Ike went about to protecting himself. by <laughs> this kind of roundabout prose that nobody could decipher. And, you know, therefore, <laughs> therefore, President who hired So he sends in, you know, I think, I can't remember if it's the 82nd or 101st, but, the, you know, one of the two famous parachute divisions, which every, everybody in my age growing up reading about World War II. Uh, you know, would have remembered. So it's, you know, so it's kind of a vivid statement. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's not a universal solution to the problem for all the reasons we've laid out. So the court repeats its authority. Eisenhower, you know, maybe somewhat, somewhat reluctantly, not too reluctantly, uh, sees no choice but to try to, you know, back up the court's judgment and, you know, to, you know, make sure uh, that African Americans are allowed to go to school. He, he federalizes the state militia as well, which you know, he has authority to do under Article One, Section 8 uh, of, of, of the Constitution. Um, you know, so it's kind of a reaffirmation of the doctrine, uh, you know, or the judicial principle. But as I say in the outline, and this actually turns around the argument of Bill Nelson's book on the 14th Amendment, uh, the real challenge, uh, you know, still awaiting the nation after 1955 or after 1958 uh, was to go from judicial principle you know, the principle that, we, that segregated schools were fundamentally wrong as a violation of any notion of equal protection, to go from the enunciation of that principle to an act of political commitment that would, uh, you know, work to enervate or destroy or undermine or whatever, uh, enforce a new commitment uh, to, to equal protection. Uh, Bill Nelson's book about the 14th Amendment, the subtitle is From Political Principle to Judicial Doctrine, so I'm playing around with it. You know, 14th Amendment is, is framed, you know, as much for political reasons. And remember, I think we had this discussion, the Republicans, or actually just the talk at the law school I went to, started the other day uh, by a guy named Kurt Lash made this point. The Republicans go to the, the electoral polls in 1866 uh, with the 14th Amendment as part of their platform. Uh, that's why they don't really need to work out ambiguities in Section 1 because they're fulfilling multiple purposes, uh, you know, for political reasons. Uh, and then over time, it's the court that has to figure out how far do we go with privileges and immunities? What are we going to mean by due process of law? When will equal protection become a valid category? Um, but here, what I'm trying to suggest is the process works in the other way. We start with the judicial principle that's laid down and that the court reinforces, 
but the challenge afterward is to turn it into a political commitment. So the challenge, you know, then thinking historically about this, or I suppose, you know, thinking like a political scientist, you know, trying to identify what factors are going to come into play or how does the story unfold uh, remains the challenge. Um, the early efforts, as, you know, as, you know, as I say on, um, you know, uh, the outline, to kind of to come up with some political postscript or some political reinforcement of, um, you know, the, the decision of Brown v. Board, uh, took the form of two, you know, two civil rights acts. You know, the first passed in, uh, the last one had been, what, 1873, so the first passed in, in eight, you, know, you know, four score years, uh, give or take. Uh, second one passed in 1960. Uh, one, uh, you know, one comment I read on this that is put on the outline, uh, the acts were so weak they were not even worth the filibuster. You know, if the South wanted to protect its vital interest, and back at, the, at that point the closure rule was you needed to have two-thirds in the Senate, not three-fifths, not to get closure. So the filibuster, which I personally think is unconstitutional on its face, and I'll explain this in the last day of the class, which will be the last time we're going to be taped. Uh, and actually, it's going to be a Stanford webinar. So we're reaching out to the alumni. So I expect you all to be here. <laughs> It'll be fun. Uh, anyhow, putting that aside. Um, so, you know, uh, the filibuster, had, you know, which was actually a very minor part of parliamentary jurisprudence previously. Uh, its primary, almost, I won't say almost its sole function, but its primary function had been to protect Southern regional interests. So when Southern senators, all of whom were the products of, you know, white voter-dominated Democratic primaries, uh, when, you know, when Southern senators feel some essential regional interest is being threatened, as would have been the case by anti-lynching anti legislation uh, back, going back to the 30s, the filibuster is always available as a pretty effective device that will prevent Congress from acting. Um, LBJ, who at this point is the majority leader of the, uh, Lind uh, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, uh, who succeeds Kennedy as president, uh, you know, as the Senate majority leader and, you know, a master politician in many ways, uh, to, you know, try to rally support behind these measures, but even someone as skillful as he was uh, didn't get very far. Uh, and so the onus of this uh, is that we have to turn to the civil, you know, in order to explain what drives the story forward, we have to turn to the civil rights movement. Uh, and is, you know, kind of the new incarnation that starts to appear uh, in the you know, very late 1950s, the very early 1960s. Which again, you know, I don't mean to kind of you know celebrate my boyhood here, but you know, but which I remember quite well from watching the 15 minutes of the evening news. There were only 50 minutes, but back in those days, they only reported news. I mean, today, as a creature of habit, I still watch CBS. You know, it's such. I'm using the expression, well, I won't use the expression. You know, but you know, watch, watching Dr. Lapook or whatever give us give me some update on my health or the soft feature stories. So they only had 50 minutes. They actually gave you in that limited, at least originally, they actually tried to give you some serious news. You know, it was a big revelation. And but actually, one of the most dramatic sets of stories they had. I mean, Vietnam became in the 1960s became the, and then of course the urban riots of the 1960s really you know, help you know, uh, uh, broadcast news to take off. But one of the great stories in the early 1960s was the portrayal of the sit-in movements uh, that began uh, in the South. You know, this is you know, kind of the famous you know, um, you know, lunch, lunch counter boycotts, uh, typically done by college students. You know, again, you know, earnest, morally informed young men. You know, taking some risks because you never know where you're going to be, you know, uh, beat up or, you know, harassed or where your family, you know, whether whatever happens in the drugstore, you know, uh, you never know what's going to happen out of doors later. So that's one frame of cases. The obvious objective here is to say, that, you know, is to break down racial segregation in public accommodations. In this sense, access to food uh, in a, you know, in a, you know, in a restaurant that, you know, in theory should be available to everyone. Um, another, of course, famous example, and in some, way, some ways more dramatic, were the Freedom Rides, which were, you know, uh, um, uh, bus rides, uh, you know, kind of typically starting in the North, you know, using facilities of interstate commerce, trying to break down forms of racial segregation and, you know, wherever you stop at a restaurant or, uh, you know, or, or, uh, you know, or whatever. And, you know, number of, say, some of these buses, the Greyhound, I think it's Greyhound, but maybe not. Yeah, there's the Greyhound. How could you miss it? This will be, this will be an idea on the final. Don't tell the others. <laughs> you know. What was the symbol on the bus? Anyhow, but you know, but you know, some of these buses were attacked, by, you know, firebombed in effect, you know, set on, you know, set on fire, and so on. So what this all represents, of course, is you know, a, in a sense, a kind of dramatic escalation uh, of the tactics of the civil rights movement. It fits perfectly well with Michael Klarman's backlash thesis, you know, which you can apply at different levels. Um, it can apply. You know, to protest marches in cities, and Selma, you know, is still in, you know, the movie is still much in the news. Uh, 
that becomes kind of, you know, one, if not the highest expression of what that meant. But the sit-ins, you know, the kind of lunch counter sit-ins, the bus rides, the freedom bus rides, uh, these, were, you know, these were kind of early examples of it. And again, taking advantage of the novelty of, you know, national, national news, um, uh, it, you, know, this, you know, this had a terrific impact. And so the importance about these knowing, is, as I think I note in passing on, uh, on the outline, is that the civil rights movement is not simply one entity. At the high end, you know, kind of pursuing the high cause of constitutional jurisprudence would be the NAACP, you know, an organization by now half a century, you know, more than half a century old. Um, you know, actually a significant part of, uh, you know, what was at that point a kind of black Jewish alliance because a significant number of liberal Jews were involved uh, as, as litigators. Jack Greenberg is, you know, kind of one of the leading, you know, uh, leading litigators in NAACP um, at this point. Um, but it's a complex movement. You know, there's the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You know, we're you know we're uh, you know, a student nonviolent coordinating kitty, you know, committee whose leading uh, scholar is my colleague Clay Carson. You know, the guy who runs the, the King Papers Project here, uh, and has for some decades. And there are reactive debates about what the strategy should be. Uh, NAACP kind of represents represents the high end of litigation. We're going to argue these cases out, however long it takes, and in the end, we know what a justice society is going to look like. But you know, there's you know there's the absorption of other other tactics, other methods, other other philosophies, and a willingness, uh, you know, to fit you know, Clarman's thesis, a willingness to provoke violence in the active sense in order to induce the national government to come aboard. And that, in a sense, gets me to the next point, uh, which is because if again in the 1960s we get into the age of Kennedy, uh, which again for me in personal terms is formative. Um, I remember, I remember being a freshman in high school, having a you know, This is really true. I used to walk about a mile to school down Dodge Avenue in Evanston. I don't know if you remember where Dodge is. We lived near Maine and Maine and Dodge, you know. Uh, and um, I had a dream that Richard Nixon was elected president, <laughs> which left me, <laughs> left me profoundly depressed one morning. One of those lingering dreams that kind of, kind of stayed with me. It took an hour to be clear. So, you know, the, Kennedy, the election Kennedy, you know, he had to be there at the time, you know, after Eisenhower for the world. You know, world to generation. I mean, one of the things said, at you know, some, some point in your life, all of you should read. I think it's one of the best books in American political history. It's not reliable at every point, but uh, Teddy White, Theodore White, Teddy White inaugurated the modern history of presidential campaign books with a book called The Making of the President in 1960. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I must have read that book 20, 30 times. You know, the way when you're a kid, you read and reread books. You know, and, and uh, you know, and so on. So it's just you know the country. You know, and one of the big things come out. There's an interesting passage in White's book where uh, he talks about Kennedy's generation. I said, discuss this when I was on the John Stewart show. <laughs> it was kind of passing remark, and I said, you know, that there was a portrait. You know, Kennedy. You know, not uh, you know, not Bobby, but his older brother John, and then, of course the brother who was killed as a bomber. They had been command level officers, field command level officers. Unit command level officers in World War II. They had been exposed to kind of problem solving, pro you know, issues in a kind of hands-on, direct way. You know, of course, Eisenhower was a great commander, but you know, from from the top down, the idea of a generational shift and so on. Um, but so this is the reason I put this slide up, as I, as I say in the outline, is this actually commemorates the famous dinner held at James Baldwin's house. James Baldwin, you know, the great Negro African American writer. Um, May 24th, 1963, which Bobby Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, a somewhat controversial appointment, uh, which Bobby Kennedy attended uh, with a number of, number of other you know, politically alert and active uh, African-American writers and intellectuals. Uh, and it was a kind of, for Bobby Kennedy, it was kind of a traumatic experience because there was, you know, this is the spring of 1963, so the protest movements in the South are well underway uh, and being you know, vig you know, vigorously waged. Um, and there's a discussion about what role should the administration play in supporting them. And Kennedy was quite disturbed to hear the kinds of sentiments uh, voiced by, uh, you know, the African American president because they were not, you know, they were, they were, they didn't seem to be very patriotic. And the Kennedys, you know, both, uh, you know, John and Bobby came to national power as cold warriors. That was, you know, Kennedy's, Kennedy's uh, inaugur inaugural speech, you know, which, uh, you know, again, we all remember if you were alive at the time. Um, you know, it was very much a summons to a kind of ongoing Cold War struggle. And the idea of the Cold War priorities over matters of domestic justice was a major part uh, of the Kennedy's uh, original position. So he's sitting, uh, sitting, Bobby sitting around with all these young African-American writers, and they're expressing all these skeptical sentiments. Like, why should we support the United States? Why should we, you know, why should African-Americans feel themselves compelled uh, 
uh, to be you know vigorous supporters of this when if you look at you know you know how, how our civil rights are being treated. But the dinner comes. So Ken, Bobby was disturbed. But the dinner comes at a moment when the Kennedy administration was in kind of you know was you know was trying to trying to figure out what his policy could be. It's coming now. It's coming under a lot of pressure. Their original policy. It's a big debate about this, and you know it's um, you know it's still going on. It's one of those debates. I'm not sure it'll ever be wholly solved. There is a major debate on saying the outline over the Kennedys and civil rights, over, you know, why did it take so long to rally them uh, to support it actively? Back in 1960, when Martin Luther King was arrested, one of uh, Jack Kennedy's critical moves, uh, you, know, you know, was, you know, was, uh, was to call Mrs. King uh, and, you know, kind of offer his reassurance and, you know, kind of his commitment of support. But that's a kind of political gesture. It's not the same as a policy. You know, it's important kind of helping to get the African-American vote, which is still a somewhat divided vote. African Americans moving clearly towards the Democrats. It's still a divided vote. You can still talk about the party of Lincoln. It would make some sense uh, to describe the Republicans. Um, so the Kennedys were, you know, Kennedys were there. So the debate is, you know, did they, you know, did they simply lack? And you know, I'm not going to resolve it. I'll just say what the issues that were, you know, uh, were they really dealing with a set of obstacles that they were puzzled to know how to overcome? Kennedy did not have strong majorities uh, in Congress. A major part of the, his first year in office <clears throat> was to open up the what's called the House Rules Committee. To get a vote, to, if you want to get anything done domestically, to get something done in, in the House, you had to crack the House Rules Committee, which was dominated by a Southern a Virginia Republican, uh, Howard Smith, who was a kind of an old line Southern Democrat. Uh, you know, to get uh, to get anything done in Congress, and Kennedy wanted to get things done. I mean, he wasn't active, as, you know, wanted to be an active as president. Took an awful lot of legwork just to open up. Uh, the you know uh, the Jones congressional procedure. So there were honest obstacles I think that Kennedy faced. Or on the other hand, uh, perhaps he and Bobby or you know those around them really needed you know a deeper education of their own. Um, as I say here, they were obsessed with foreign policy. It took some time for civil rights to really come to the fore in their imagination. <clears throat> That's why the activity of you know, civil rights protesters, you know, bus riders. Uh, you know, lunch, lunch, lunch counter synthesize, you know, the, the whole part which plays so well into Carmen's notion of the backlash thesis. That's why they work so well. Um, even then, of course, you have a kind of critical problem, which is in, uh, in the American system of federalism, particularly is operating down to this point, to make any progress in terms of abating the, uh, you know, the kind of coercive enforcement of racial subordination in the South, you needed to have some way to get local law officials to comply. Local officials mean from the governor on down, from governors down to sheriffs. And not just officials, but also citizens. Because if, in fact, you have a basis for prosecuting people, and you can revive, actually, some of the civil rights legislation the civil, from the Civil War period. It actually gave the federal government some basis for prosecuting um, you know, different kinds of acts that would deny equal, you know, due process and equal protection. Even then, you would need to be able to crack you need to be able to get juries to convict. You need to be able to open the jury system. You need to try to get representative juries. And you need them to reach the point where they're actually willing to rule on the evidence. That takes some time. There's a great book on this subject. I'm pretty sure it's on the bibliography of a guy named Michael Belknap, B-E-L-K-N-A-P, and I'm blanking on the title. But it's the, the great thing about the book is it explains how, by 1964, the Southern jury system, you know, not just the law enforcement system, but the Southern jury system. You can finally get Southern jurors, at least in federal courts, to start voting convictions. And that, that serves as a kind of measure of the progress being, you know, be, being made. So the upshot of this is, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the struggles go on. Uh, another famous photograph. Sure. What was the mech what did they do to get the local leaders on board or to change the southern What did they do? <laughs> well, they had to, you know, they did the best they could. It's mostly political. I mean, I think that's I mean, I think that's the basic story. I mean, there are repeated efforts made by the administration. I mean, I think uh, the Kennedy brothers and, you know, the other Justice Department officials like Burke Marshall and so on, they spent a lot of time on the phone in these kinds of, you know, somewhat ambiguous conversations with governors on down, trying to get them to do what they think they're supposed to do. Uh, and it's a drawn up process and it produced, produced very mixed results. So it's not very satisfactory. It's one of the things that points, you know, the way towards the need to have additional legislation that will beef up the direct federal judicial presence in the South. But as part of this, like, this is Belknap's argument, as part of this, there does come a point where you can start getting Southerners who are willing 
you know, to vote their conscience. You know, not, not just to act on the basis of racial alliance, but to vote their conscience uh, and, you know, and to start delivering convictions. So by the summer of 1963, there's no question uh, that, you know, however you account for their, their progress, there's no question that the Kennedys are moving towards active support of civil rights uh, legislation. But they're still dealing with the Congress, which has the filibuster rule, where Southern Democrats are, you know, a, a major part of the political party, where because of the existing rules of seniority, which I'm sure you guys all know about, but, you know, now, now Congress typically operates under kind of, in effect, under term limit provision, so there's a lot of rotation in committee chairmanship. Not in the old days. Uh, you know, in the old days it was strictly, you know, I think in both houses, uh, it was, but particularly in the Senate, uh, it was strictly a seniority system. Of course, Southerners coming from a one-party region uh, would have real advantage. You know, the North is much more competitive politically. Uh, the South is not. So if you're an incumbent, it takes an awful lot. I mean, now, too, as well. But even then, it took even much more to us and So, you know, you have, you have lots and lots of Southerners serving four and five terms. Um, you know, and they're all, they're all heirs to the, you know, they're, they're all legatees of um, the system of race subordination. The great, anybody know who the great case here? The kind of the, the interesting counterpoint case? It's not counterpoint, but the case that's often discussed here. It's a kind of really interesting example of how the system worked. Is William Fulbright, you know, from Arkansas. Is this the name you guys know? F-U-L-B-R-I-G-H-T? You know, when you age in this business, as I've done, you know, knowledge of current events lags far behind, you know, historical, anyhow. So Fulbright was, you know, much admired, you know, a real Southern intellectual, you know, well-educated, Rhodes Scholar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, became a very kind of, you know, became kind of a, you know, a hero on the left in the mid to late 60s because he started, because uh, after a kind of acquiescing in Johnson's policies in Vietnam, Fulbright started to become more and more of a critic. So liberals liked him. But even with Fulbright, you know, so he, you know, person people on the left generally admired because eventually he's willing to stand up to LBJ on Vietnam issues. But even there, you know, to get election to the South, you have to maintain loyalty to the racial system. So, you know, so that's kind of the accommodation. Anyhow, by the summer of 1963, there's not much question where the administration stands. The political objectives, the polit excuse me, political obstacles are still there. And that's, of course, where Kennedy's assassination, this, this, of course, is the famous photo from the plane after Kennedy was killed. Uh, in, I'm sure you guys have seen this, the LBJ staring the oath. It's Lady Bird on his left, uh, Jackie, well, uh, on his right, our left, Jackie, obviously on the right, still wearing the blood-stained coat uh, that she'd been wearing, you know, when Kennedy's brains were blown out uh, by, uh, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald. So, you know, so we, you know, we, um, so as I said, we have this moment of conversion. Uh, 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 there was a national tragedy in Lyndon Johnson, a person whom I hated <laughs> when I was your age, but you know, like many people really come to admire, uh, came to the fore. He wins re-election, of course, in 1964, defeating Barry Goldwater. At that point, I hoped, somewhat naively, that the Republican Party might actually disappear from the face of the earth. That turned out to be wrong for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, they're, 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 they're with us still. But, you know, so Johnson was a kind of New Deal Democrat, you know, from Texas, school teacher, uh, profoundly liberal, um, you know, a real deal maker. You know, his physical presence by every account was, you know, your, your personal space was always in danger if you were with LBJ. You know, now you can listen to tapes of his conversations, including lots of tapes from the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So Johnson is part of his campaign strategy, consciously. I mean, I think this is what is deeply admirable about him. Uh, he may have had expedient political reasons of his own. I mean, what politician doesn't? He wanted to be elected in his own right. What politician does not? He had a chance to be president of the United States. Kennedys had not treated him well. They weren't big fans of LBJ. Uh, he and Bobby, in particular, had a very you know, troubled and testy relationship uh, in all this. But you know, uh, LBJ became president, and he threw the full weight of, of the national government in his own very formidable political skills, which you would ne uh, you'd never want to underestimate uh, behind the cause of enacting uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And after that, after his, his great victory over uh, Barry Goldwater, um, pretty, pretty interesting character in his own right, actually. I mean, you know, Goldwater is much more than current Republican senators, was really an independent-minded thinker uh, who just kind of you know, spoke his conscience. I mean, he wasn't a toady. Uh, 
uh, the way so many members of Congress are now. Uh, but in any case, you know, actually, actually worked for the Democratic National Committee in 1964. In Johnson, now they think about Johnson's campaign, mostly just reading the Chicago press. Uh, anyhow, put it, you know, putting, putting that to one side. I missed the election. No, 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 I was too young to vote then. That's right. I remember the election quite well. Okay, so LBJ throws his weight behind. I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to talk about the passage of the Civil Rights Act. What I want to do is just try to lay out, I've got 10 minutes left, to try to lay out what it did and why it loomed so large and, and what some of the, some of the, the, the issues were. Um, so the first point I want to make, this under the, the heading Achieving Consensus in Congress under a Master of Legislator Term President, i.e., or e.g., whatever, LBJ. First is, there is a powerful lesson for our time. Uh, our time meaning this moment. Uh, what, I guess we're waiting to see what's going to happen with the Homeland Security Day, but just you know, as another current example. Uh, I think most scholars who look at this say, there's, you know, this is really a truly remarkable episode in American political history because uh, with some prior judicial prodding, but now, you know, the courts are to one side on this. Uh, it's not, the court is not playing an active role in terms of promoting the agenda uh, of change in, 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 in matters of, uh, you know, securing equal, prote equal protection. The whole story is how did the president and both houses of Congress manage to combine in 1964 and 1965 to produce two truly landmark pieces of legislation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which had, you know, uh, certainly would have been worth the filibuster if they did get a filibuster, uh, but was certainly worth, you know, every every page and every every comma or whatever with which it was written, and then the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965, um, and so you know, a big part of this story, and I, I didn't bring any. Well, actually, I did bring a slide in here. This is LBJ. Everybody know who the character on the left is? It's actually my former senator. A. Fortas was never a senator. Is it Arthur Goldberg? Uh, Arthur Goldberg was never a senator. Arthur Goldberg was uh, Arthur Goldberg. Uh, there were two senators from Illinois when I was a kid. <laughs> One was Paul Douglas, who was a Cold War liberal from 1948, fought in the Marines. Uh, <coughs> I met him once or twice. He was the Democrat. Uh, and the other was Everett Dirksen, whose son-in-law was, Lily, do you know this? Little trivia question: uh, The late Howard Baker, later the you know from Tennessee. So Dirksen, Dirksen must have smoked I don't know three packs a day. I don't know, but he yeah, had the deepest, you know, throatiest voice you could possibly imagine. Um, but you know he was willing. You know he was willing to work with LBJ. So this was the the key thing about the politics of this is this was this was the era 1042. This was the era uh, when uh, the parties were in a sense well. Uh, there was no Republican Southern Party to speak of. Democrats were a perfectly national party, but what was different is there were Republican liberals and moderates. Dirksen wasn't really one. Dirksen's kind of more towards the center right. But other people like Hugh Scott from Pennsylvania or Jake Javits from New York, uh, there were, you know, so it's not, if you do the, what do you call those diagrams, um, that you have to do with the Poole Rosenthal scores in political science. I mean, now if you look at the American Congress, uh, our Congress, Congress has never been more polarized than it is today. You know, all the Republicans are one side, all the Democrats are one side. There's none of that cross-hatched gray area in between. There's just, you know, there's, there's no overlap at all on any kind of ideological spectrum. It wasn't like that in the 60s. So you had Southern Democrats who were much more conservative than Northern Republican liberals. You had Northern Republican liberals perfectly happy to work with Northern, you know, Western Democratic liberals. Um, but they do come from different parties. They had somewhat different sets of priorities. Uh, and this worked itself out in the civil rights uh, legislation. And, you know, it's really my second set of points. So let me just say something about what I've got about seven minutes here. I think I can get through, uh, maybe I have to leave the Voting Rights Act and say something about that uh, next week. But let's at least try to get through the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So, again, a landmark piece of legislation designed to prohibit discrimination in a variety of forms. What was, you know, I think there are 12 titles to it. Um, the three most important were Title II, Title VI, and Title VII. Title II relates to public accommodations. Go back to the image of, um, you know, the lunch counter sit-ins or, you know, people riding buses expecting to have access to uh, public facilities on a non-discriminatory basis. Uh, the whole idea here was, you know, to say, you know, remember, you have to go, we have to go back to the 19th century. Remember that in the civil rights, so-called civil rights cases of uh, 
1883, the Supreme Court had overturned or had sharply limited the Civil Rights Acts of the 1870s, which had set out, I think the last was 1875, those acts had set out to try to place some limitations on private acts of discrimination, not just public acts, but private acts as well. Um, but they had never been, the civil rights cases of 1883 had effectively gutted uh, those measures, um, you know, the, those, those acts, and you know, in you know, four score years had now passed uh, since you'd had a real basis for enforcement. With the Civil Rights Act of 1964, directed explicitly against the South, uh, the federal government commits itself uh, to making, uh, you know, to requiring desegregation in public accommodations. The, uh, the, um, the, the Title II was challenged pretty quickly by a place called Ollie's Barbecue. And I'm forgetting where it was. Habib, do you oh, know? Is it? Alabama. In Alabama. Yeah. Roll Tide Roll. But, you know, fortunately, they didn't get to the finals this year, thank God. So anyhow, one of my students actually went to Ollie's Barbecue and brought me back a bottle of their sauce some years ago, which I have to confess I no longer have, never used and no longer have with me. I, I tend to roll my own when it comes to when it comes to barbecuing. The interesting thing about this case is when it's tried, the court relies on the Commerce Clause. You know, it's not, so it's not an equal protection case. And it's an interesting set of questions here. Again, we're in this post caroline products world, right? Where the commerce power is to be interpreted broadly. Uh, equal protection remains, as then, as it remains for us today, a very difficult, always controversial doctrine. What exactly do we mean by equality? Philosophically, it's not, you know, and since Lily is a philosopher you know, of sorts, it's not the easiest question to sort out. But the commerce power, you know, the mid-1960s is a very robust power, and it's sufficient for the purposes. So that's a, that's a great step forward. You're gonna, you know, all the segregated theaters, segregated restaurants, blacks can't eat here, you can't stay there, go around the back door, maybe we'll give you the dregs or whatever. Those days are going forever. And of course, I should say that a lot of that had been dramatized by the whole story of Jackie Robinson and the integration of baseball. And Mr. Cobb, Ernie Banks, was the first African American on the Cubs. I'll mention him in passing and in mourning. Um, so Title II, uh, really, the, you know, in some ways, the most obvious uh, goal to be secured here. Title VI is kind of a sleeper, federally assisted programs. Um, I said the other day that, you know, independent of how we think about formal constitutional authority, well, actually not independent, uh, the funding power of the federal government uh, particularly in the post-1945 warfare state, and now increasingly because of Johnson's other program, the Great Society, which I'm, I'm not going to say much about, but uh, Johnson's great program of uh, primarily of urban uh, reform, not just urban reform, but with that animus, uh, federal government is you know, providing massive amounts of money, both through the defense establishment uh, and for domestic purposes. And when it provides the money, it can also lay down the conditions under which that money will be spent. So nobody thinks much about this. I mean, it's not really an active subject of controversy. But the big, the big federal footprint or imprint or whatever on public spending, and then the requirement is if you want the money, you have to conform to our standards of racial justice. So that's, you know, that's kind of the sleep requirement. Then, of course, famously, there's Title, Se Title VII designed to limit uh, and you know, reduce, prevent discrimination. Uh, in employment. And you know, the famous addition here is the addition of sex. Um, it's sometimes treated as kind of a joke that the opponents of um, uh, you know, Title VII raised, but Alex? Yeah, I thought that was actually initially suggested by opponents of the Civil right, Rights Act right, as a right. way to hopefully try to take away support, right. and then they were unpleasantly surprised that right. it just sort of stuck. Well, it wasn't that it just sort of stuck. I mean, so it is so one standard treatment says, yeah, exactly as Alex said, it was proposed as kind of a joke or maybe to kind of, ha, 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 isn't this funny what they want to do? Um, but in fact, there's a significant number, well, not, a, not as large as today, but there were a number of, some number of women, actually including, uh, our, our, well, not at this one, but this time my congressional representative was actually Don Rumsfeld, who I met in the, the only time I met him was in our family kitchen in 1962. Therein lies the story, but you won't get that one today. <laughs> Uh, but our previous representative had been a woman. There were a number of women, you know, some number of women, not like today, there were a number of women in Congress who, who for very legitimate reasons, felt that sex was a legitimate addition. Uh, so it may have been, it was, it was a joke to some, it wasn't a joke to others. Uh, so its inclusion there is not to be treated as some kind of random mistake, which, whose consequences we're still trying to cope with. It does become, you know, for substantive reasons. 
uh, part, you know, part of the litigation. So I'm down to about, uh, what do I have here? Uh, one, 30 seconds, but who's counting? <laughs> 30 seconds, but who's counting? So maybe, I guess, yeah, maybe we should spend a little more time with this on, um, uh, you know, on, on Monday, uh, moving a different set of issues next week. But let me just try to conclude by saying, you know, there is an enormous lesson here, which I think really, you know, which, you know, does have lasting significance for how we should think about the system. What conditions are, you know, you know, what circumstances, what conditions, what concerns, what ambitions, et cetera, were necessary uh, or made it possible uh, for the national government, all three branches, including two houses of Congress, to effectively collaborate in what was, in effect, uh, you know, the equivalent of a political revolution in American constitutionalism. Uh, the second reconstruction, in many ways, provides the answer that the, you know, I said previously in the course, if the, fir if the first Reconstruction was, I think, the great tragedy in the history of America, or the failure of the first Reconstruction was the great tragedy in the history of American constitutionalism, the success of the second Reconstruction uh, was, you know, something we should genuinely celebrate. But of course, it also had profound consequences. The very last point I'll make here, uh, looking ahead of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Lyndon Johnson, being the politician he was, understood or anticipated what has become the main, what became the main political consequence of the enactment of this legislation, which was that the South might eventually become either more or even go Republican with profound consequences for how, how our political system has operated, we'll say, you know, maybe not in the 70s, but at least since the 1980s. Okay, so that's a wrap for today. Thanks a lot. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.